Chicago television station, someone using sophisticated equipment managed to briefly and illegally override broadcast signals on WGN-TV and WTTW. Jack Connerty reports now that both incidents are under investigation. <laughs> Even in a medium that is no stranger to bizarre moments, these were truly bizarre. Starting first on WGN-TV at 9.14 Sunday night during a sportscast. 12 quarters finally did. Take some pretty sophisticated uh, microwave equipment operating in the broadcast uh, auxiliary frequency bands and uh, a significant amount of power. About two hours later, the video pirate struck again. This time, the target was a science fiction broadcast on PBS affiliate WTTW. And this time, it wasn't 25 seconds long. It ran for almost a minute and a half. <laughs> By this time, the pirate had managed to insert audio as well, along with a display of a marital aid and a portion of his or her anatomy. It generated hundreds of calls. Really kind of expressing uh, sympathy over the fact uh, that uh, our signal would be interfered with this in this way and that it would inconvenience so many thousands of our viewers. The incidents are now under investigation by the FCC and the FBI. But the odds, I'd say, if a guy continues to involve himself, either sporadically or continuously, uh, it's very great that we will determine who it is. All early evidence points to someone with a broadcasting background. Someone who really knows the business and uh, microwave in general. Here's our first page right here. These are the vital trickster texts. Now, there's a lot to say about trickster texts. Um, in fact, uh, the trickster and tricksterism as it exists in myth, media, and practice, one could actually dedicate a lifetime of scholarship to it. But here are some of like the big ones you should know. Definitely Trickster and the Paranormal by George Henson. The Principia Discordia, which is kind of like the Bible of a, a group we're going to look into later that are into tricks and tricksterism. Culture Jam, which we're going to go into also. And uh, what was that right there? Through the uh, eyes of science, uh, myth, and the trinkster and synchronicity. We're going to kind of look at all this sort of material in a very small way throughout this presentation. So here we go. These are the keywords that you need for the trickster. Shape-shifting, trap, trick, liar, prankster, goof, clown, between worlds, con artist, hoaxer, misdirection, flair, stealth, skill and talent, liminality, genius, anti-structure, smooth talker, Paranormal, magic, riddles, madness, sage, teacher, sometimes horny, which we'll get into, I guess, maybe a little bit. Jokes, terrorist, terrorism, anti-authority, and of course, for the lulls, which means for the fun of it. Recontextualization. But what we're really going to have a look at is this idea. This is a word I use a lot in my own writing. It's really just another way to say reorientation, but here the focus is on context, as in what context do you find yourself in? In the case of tricksters, a trick or a prank changes the context for whoever is being tricked. Just as any good trap uh, has to be well camouflaged to be effective. And there is always a before and after. There is your situation before the trick and the situation after the trick. And this handy hermetic image illustrates the idea of recontextualization, going from one world into another. Fundamentally a shapeshifter and defined by it. So let's take a look at some trickster archetypes. Here are a few that might look familiar. Bugs Bunny, the mask like we saw earlier. Andy Kaufman, who's a real life person and not a cartoon character. Um, Eris, the goddess of chaos down there in the, in the middle. We're going to find out about Diogenes. And in the far uh, bottom corner, those creepy looking dudes, those are the men in black, and the men in black in UFO literature are also definitely tricksters as well. 
But the important thing is that tricksters can usually change as needed. And that's sort of their superpower. They're shapeshifters, depending on the situation they're in. The trickster is universally loved in Western culture. Uh, we love clever characters, especially characters that either mock, outsmart, or subterfuge authority. However, the trickster is also feared, and that's for two reasons. One is that uh, being the object of the trickster's attention can spell mayhem for us. And two is that the trickster can turn your world upside down, irrevocably soul. so. And this can be as disturbing as it is enlightening. The trickster is always an agent of chaos uh, for somebody out there in the world. So here are a few of our uh, beloved tricksters. I'm sure you know most of these folks. Um, they're generally geniuses and incredibly clever and creative. Um, they are always multi-talented, uh, often to the point of seeming magical. And they're fun. <clears throat> now, um, as a note on just how loved the trickster is, not just in America, but around the world, uh, it speaks volumes to the popularity of the trickster that this video clip we're about to watch um, has been seen over three billion times and was for a while the single most popular video on all of YouTube. Now what's especially interesting is how few people, relatively speaking, on the planet actually speak Korean and understand the lyrics. But that's basically irrelevant. And that's how um, likable uh, an effective trickster can be. Gangnam Style Gangnam Style Nachin and Tasaro on Inga Jogging Yoja Coffee Hanjan and Yoyur Ann and Pumpio in the Yoja Bami Om Yashim Jangi to Gawajin and Yaja Guran Ban John in the Yoja Nana Sana Air Nachin and Nama Kutasaro on Kasana Air Coffee Shiki Do John and One Shot Open Gangnam Style Gangnam Style Op, 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 op Open Gangnam Style tired of Psy. Psy is the best. Um, here we go. So naturally you've got your happy tricksters and now you've got your terrifying tricksters. Tricksters are also to be feared. In fact, there might be nothing as frightening as the trickster. They employ traps, pranks, disguises, misdirections, decoy, genius, and they have, uh, they often have little regard for law, taboo, or the safety of others. Um, to that end, they can be like uh, quite disturbing, if not uh, lethal. Okay, so here's a scene from a uh, little recognized but profoundly good horror film called The Exorcist Three. In this scene, actor Brad Dorif here is playing a man possessed by the spirit of the Gemini killer. And it gives us a taste of the disturbing side of the trickster. Tell the press that I am the Gemini Lieutenant or I will punish you. Punish me? Yes. What are you talking about? Do you dance? What do you mean? I 
I like plays. The good ones, Shakespeare. I like Titus Andronicus the best. It's sweet. Incidentally, did you know that you are talking to an artist? I sometimes do special things to my victims, things that are creative. Of course, it takes knowledge, pride in your work. For example, a decapitated head can continue to see for approximately 20 seconds. So when I have one that's cocking, I always hold it up so that it can see its body. It's a little extra I throw in for no added charge. <laughs> I must admit it makes me chuckle every time. Life is fun. It's a wonderful life, in fact. For some. Um, this is another scene from The Exorcist 3. Like their good-natured counterparts, evil tricksters often have a sense of humor, though it is often very, very sick and very dark. Uh, now, beyond the shape-shifting that's been mentioned, a parallel that runs to the recontextualization feature, and another one of the main commonalities that we find is that uh, tricksters disrupt systems. And they sometimes have to do very little to start off a chain reaction that powerfully and sometimes irrevocably disrupts whatever system they are engaged in. We'll see more of this in an upcoming section that I think everyone will like on the paranormal. Here are some of the usual areas of disruption, patriarchy, rationality, causality, science, materialism, categories, predictability, rigidity, tradition, binaries. Yeah, that's right. All of these are victims of the trickster. A quick demonstration of the spectrum of trickster manifestations in world culture. Uh, this, is, uh, this is good because it shows an immediate difference between types. On your left side here, we have a Nancy, a lavish and uh, a selfish trickster god um, from Ghana. And to the right, we have Diogenes, and Diogenes was a, an impoverished activist and a real live mortal person. The important thing, though, is that they're both hellraisers and that they both uh, disrupt the systems within their embedded. So here's Diogenes. Diogenes was not a god or a god goddess or a fairy or a sprite or a demon or a cartoon character, but a living, anti-materialistic mortal being. He was born in 412 or 404 BCE, no one's really sure, and banished from Sinope for debasing currency appropriately enough. He then moved to Athens to terrorize the populace with his own original take on cynical philosophy. He chose to play the role of a homeless philosopher, satirist, anarchist clown, and he acted in outrageous ways, an effort to basically confront his community of peers with what they were putting out into the world by means of their own contrived social realities. He also did this, no doubt, also to please his own razor wit. Tricksters are in love with their own tricks and can be quite narcissistic about them. Narcissism and tricksterism run very closely together frequently. He was also known to urinate and defecate on people or places that offended him and was caught uh, publicly masturbating. And he famously said, quote, Oh, if only it were as easy to banish my hunger by rubbing my belly. Here he is depicted living in the streets with his famous stray dogs. Diogenes is said to have a great love of animals. Being homeless, Diogenes tended to linger about in liminal states and places, in between places. And we're going to get to liminality later. Here's one of the many things he was famous for walking around during a bright afternoon with a burning lantern. He would do this while telling his fellow citizens that he was looking for an honest man. Naturally, he claimed he was never able to find an honest man. And this is one of the key elements that really unites all tricksters, and that's stunts. 
in this case, uh, social philosophical stunts, which we're going to get into in the next section as well. Like many encounters with a trickster, they often result in multiple, sometimes conflicting accounts. Alexander the Great's meeting with Diogenes is no exception. The parts that are in agreement is that uh, Alexander heard that a real life philosopher was in the neighborhood and he was pumped to go meet him. One version goes like this, everyone came to town to meet with Alexander the Great, everyone except for Diogenes. But Alexander had heard so much about him that he wanted to meet Diogenes most of all. Alexander went in person to see him and he found him laying in the sun in a suburb outside of town, a liminal state. Diogenes raised himself up a little when he saw so many people coming towards him, his eyes fixed on Alexander. When Alexander addressed him with greetings and asked if he wanted anything, uh, Diogenes said, yes, you can stand out of my sunlight. It is said that Alexander was so struck by this and admired so much the haughtiness and grandeur of the man who had nothing but scorn for him that he said to his followers who were laughing and jesting about the philosopher as they went away, Alexander is rumored to have said, but truly, if I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. Another version has Alexander hopping around the philosopher, begging him for some piece of true philosophical wisdom. Diogenes, ever the ready prop comic, had a pile of bones nearby and starts digging through them. Confused, Alexander asks, what is he doing? Diogenes explains, I am searching for the bones of your father, but cannot distinguish them from those of a slave. Diogenes is one manifestation of the trickster force, and indeed a socio-political philosophic type that we're going to look into next. Uh, I wanted to stop here to look at the diversity of which uh, can be hurled under the trickster archetype category. Many lie, tease, prank, trap, confuse, pun, riddle, joke, fool, clown, hornswoggle, flim flam, backstab, beat up, and incite war, often entirely for themselves. And they have none of the arguably pro social motives that Diogenes has. That is, at least in terms of revealing the backwards nature of certain aspects of society, like classism and hypocrisy, to the rest of his people. With other sorts of tricksters, any kind of enlightened aftermath is the kind that you get when you realize just how badly you got caught in their webs. So with that, let's uh, get into a few uh, standard appearances of the shapeshifter, and we'll start with the tarot. <laughs> The major arcana are so named because they represent the arcane or secret principles of life. In the Enchanted Tarot, these universal experiences are represented by archetypal figures. They appear in varying forms in all cultures, both ancient and modern. In the Tarot, each figure depends on the one that precedes it. This progression is really a journey, one taken by each soul in search of self-knowledge. It is, in truth, a cycle which can occur many times within one's life, so that every end is really a beginning. We begin each journey of self-discovery as the fool. This traveler, our deeper self, embodies both our male and female sides. In complete innocence, the fool can explore the limitless possibilities within each moment. Eagerly, the fool tosses his pouch onto his back and leaps onto the road of life. Next, please. The tarot can be read as a series of images representing the evolution or phases of one's subjective consciousness or the universe itself. This is not unlike the hero's journey Joseph Campbell describes. In the tarot, the universe of consciousness always begins with an essence that has been called the fool. It is represented numerically as zero to emphasize that all things come from the womb uh, that is within the fool's deeper nature. Foolness, we could say, um, inherently disrupts reality on a cosmological scale. To exist is to disrupt an otherwise unmoving universe. This is what physicists, physicists would call homogeneous isotropic. That means the same essence or substance or state existing uniformly and statically everywhere. The fool moves around this or changes this by being. 
The fool takes the risk, and to exist is the risk. To live is to take risks. To act is to risk. To not act is also to take a risk. And to act at all is inherently to disrupt on a cosmological scale. To exist is to disrupt an otherwise unmoving universe. But it's the act. The fool acts. This is essential. The fool makes the move. And that is actually all of what life does. Life makes the move. All life acts. And that is the fool. It's, the whole idea is this. The fool is foolish enough to act. And that's important to consider, metaphysically speaking, foolish enough to act. And that's important to consider. Uh, to possibly be wrong, to possibly die, life acting and experimenting as it crosses through time and space, encountering environment after environment, creature after creature, domain after domain. This is the origin of all things, not just in the tarot, but in our lives and in biology. But at the same time, this cosmology has a high level of humor because it's saying to do anything is a fool's errand. We have no clue what the ultimate implication of anything we do is, nor does any creature when it acts, but we all do it anyway, all the time. It's the fool's errand, and yet it must be done. All living things act and must act. We are always making a move deeper into the unknown, the darkness. This is the story of life at all time and at all places. Indeed, it's the story of stories, fools acting in effort towards becoming. When one gets a handle on this primordiality, I'll say, that the fool represents, or primordialness that the fool represents, at least in terms of the cosmology of the tarot, you eventually become skilled, knowledgeable, and focused. They become the matured magician, card number one of the tarot, but that would be for a different lecture. All tricksters and fools are kinetic and dynamic. Not only do they move, they move like nothing else moves. They are all possible movements, all conveyable moves. That's their trick. They represent the force that could pull it off. With trickster incarnations, we don't have a brooding, slow, giant slumbering on a rocky pillow, nor do we have any kind of life-birthing mother goddess, and we don't have the typical warrior king hero. We have an archetype that is defined and deified by its plurality and kinetics. It's a boundaryless, pan-dimensional mobility. Often there is no territory that the trickster can't or won't touch. The uncanny, the impossible, the taboo, the disgusting, offensive, a genius, or even the deplorable are all on the table. If you won't go there, the trickster will go there. The stories and mythologies that come out of the global archetype of the trickster are the stories of a character doing what other characters can't or won't dare do. So since he does everything, represents the doing of everything, the cream of the weirdness, impressiveness, absurd, and vulgar crop naturally rises to the top. Trickster archetype and gonzo journalist put it succinctly when he said, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. Now let's look at some mythological manifestations of the trickster. And Nancy, the spider, sometimes spider, sometimes man, a revered god of mischief from Ghana. Anansi is also the origin of all stories and all storytellers of the universe. And the universe is made of stories. So we're going to sit through um, one of Anansi's stories right here, which Neil Gaiman covered in his book, The Anansi Boys. This is called The Dead Grandmother Story. Let me tell you a story about Anansi, the time his grandmother died. It's okay, she was a very old woman and she went in her sleep. It happens. She died a long way from home. So Anansi, he goes across the island with his handcart and he gets his grandmother's body and he puts it on the handcart and he wheels it home. He's going to bury her by the banyan tree at the back of his hut, you see. Now, he's passing through the town, after pushing his grandmother's corpse in the cart all morning, and he thinks, I need some whiskey. So he goes into the shop, for there is a shop in that village, a store that sells everything, where the shopkeeper is a very hasty-tempered man. And Nancy, he goes in and he drinks some whiskey. He drinks a little more whiskey, and he thinks, I should play a trick on this fellow. 
So he says to the shopkeeper, Go take some whiskey to my grandmother, sleep it in the cart outside. You may have to wake her, for she's a sound sleeper. So the shopkeeper, he goes out to the cart with a bottle, and he says to the old lady in the cart, Hey, here's your whiskey. But the old lady, she not say anything. And the shopkeeper, he's just getting angrier and angrier, for he was such a hasty-tempered man, saying, Get up, old woman, get up and drink your whiskey. But the old woman, she says nothing. Then she does something that the dead sometimes do in the heat of the day. She flatulates loudly. Well, the shopkeeper, he's so angry with this old woman for flatulating at him that he hits her, and then he hits her again. And now he hits her one more time, and she tumbles down from the handcart onto the ground. And Ansi, he runs out and he starts a crying and a wailing and a carrying on and saying, My grandmother, she's a dead woman. Look what you did. Murderer, evildoer. Now the shopkeeper, he says to Anansi, Don't you tell anyone I done this. And he gives Anansi five whole bottles of whiskey and a bag of gold and a sack of plantains and pineapples and mangoes to make him hush his carrying on and to go away. He thinks he killed Anansi's grandmother, you see. So Anansi, he wheels his handcart home and he buries his grandmother underneath the banyan tree. All right, so that was Anansi. Now we can't talk about tricksters without talking about chaos. This is Eris, goddess of chaos. Eris' big claim to fame was that she got snubbed from going to a wedding and it went on to start a war. How she did so was by creating a golden apple with the word Callisti written on it, which means to the prettiest one of all, and drops it into the wedding ceremony. This of course raises all hell among the attendees. No one knows who it's for, and everyone at the same time wants it. I'm the prettiest. No, I'm the prettiest. The famous heiress story represents what happens to a system when an extra novel factor is thrown in. Chaos. But this chaos also displays maddening levels and dimensions of exchange and happening and meaning after it. Here we see Eris quite literally hurling an x-factor into the equation. Keep in mind the golden apple x-factor. It's going to play a particularly interesting note when we get into the paranormal. Panic breaks out and eventually leads to an all-out war. An epic drama unfolds with one tiny catalyst. The trickster is the butterfly effect. <laughs> now with more novelty. That's the whole idea. Here we go. We're disrupting systems. That's what Callisti did, the golden apple, completely disrupted everything going on around it. We get novelty because with this extra novel factor is introduced, things happen that beforehand couldn't have been predicted or couldn't have happened at all. As we leave myths and gods and goddesses and look at the living social human hybrid of this force and social roles, what is the trickster among human beings? It's the clown, it's the jester, it's the mime, the actor, the buffoon, and so on. If you were a court jester back in the day, you would have a very good place in society. These people dressed as godlike as their royal masters in terms of a, and they had a very powerful, delineated superhero-like ability within the social court. Uh, you were not a cloned peasantry. You were a singular power and uh, effect wielder. You were in fact a class when you were a court jester. Your duty was to entertain, to lambast, to socially destroy, and oftentimes to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth the whole truth in such a way that it would have gotten anyone else killed. In this way, you are somewhat of uh, your community's id. It's unconscious bursting out onto a public stage. There really is so much to say about the court gesture and the clown than can be covered in this talk, uh, but there's a lot of academic work out there on this thing, particularly the court gesture and the clown. But what is most interesting about the court gestures is that they were established anti-establishment institution. And let me re re repeat that. Court gestures were established anti-establishment institution. Very interesting. 
they existed exclusively to undermine the very social reality that they were embedded in. They were given an excellent lifestyle by the king or whoever employed them to do this, and they were a kind of a valve for society's psyche in this way. The clown, of course, parodies the outer and the inner sense of self, outward in appearance and inward in terms of emotional states. This parody um, offers the observer a gestalt by which to analyze these states in a discreet, disconnected, and comic fashion. What was tragic becomes when just a few feet away from ground zero of the tragic becomes comic. Our own experiences are none too far from this comparison. Meh. Clowns and court jester kinds of energy would leave the court and continue to be part of the social, political, and artistic forces. And they would continue to comment on society. They would look like Dada, the surrealists, and eventually the situationists and fluxus folk. These artistic movements would, consciously or not, hear the call of the clown, of the trickster, as a vehicle of communication, as well as a pan-dimensional freeform energy that uh, shakes the squares and the status quo. And eventually kitsch like this shows up. One last thought. It should be appreciated that the Joker we find uh, Batman always trying to subdue um, is a clown, but it's also an assault on culture at large, and especially the urban, the city. The clown, the Joker, the Joker is a clown to inform us that we, uh, we uh, and what we have created, civilization itself, and the concept of progress, that's the real joke. All the horrors of Gotham and the clown's existence is, and the Joker's existence is, in the last analysis, all our own fault. Okay, trickster religions, a return to the political philosophic. Eris returns as a central figure in a religion in the 1950s known as Discordianism. In this segment, Robert Anton Wilson is going to describe what Discordianism is far better than I can. Spectacles, testicles, brandy, cigars. You're all popes. You're all absolutely infallible. I have the authority to appoint anybody a Discordian Pope because I'm a Discordian Pope. The first rule after you become a Discordian Pope is to excommunicate every Discordian Pope you meet. This is based on the basic Discordian principle, we Discordians must stick apart. Discordians don't have dogmas, uh, which are absolute beliefs. We have catmas, which are relative meta-beliefs. Uh, the, the central Discordian catma is, as I said before, uh, any affirmation is true in some sense, false in some sense, meaningless in some sense, true and false in some sense, true and meaningless in some sense, false and meaningless in some sense, and true and false and meaningless in some sense. And if you repeat this 666 times, you will achieve supreme enlightenment in some, <laughs> in some sense. There are approximately 12 million Discordian popes now. Originally, Balaclips the Younger, the founder of Discordianism, had cards printed and uh, he'd just hand them out to everybody he met, making them popes. And then I printed the Pope card in the Illuminatus trilogy. But then I was living in Ireland and uh, the Pope came to Phoenix Park and announced, the guy who thinks he's the only Pope, uh, he announced that bishops could give indulgences over television which was a new thing in Catholic doctrine. And I got the idea, well, if they can do indulgences on television, I can do pontifications. And so instead of giving out cards, every time I got on radio or television, I made the whole audience popes. Eventually, we'll make every man, woman, and child on this planet a pope. Most religious people take themselves too damn seriously, which is why they act like such damn fools. I'm using the word damn deliberately for the paradoxical effect. Like I'm also a Buddhist, a Taoist, and a Confucian, as well as a Discordian, a Subgenius, and a Witch.
I will officially announce that everybody in this room is now a Discordian Pope, just like me. You are all absolutely infallible and don't take crap from anybody. Okay. Well, I'm, a, I'm an ordained pope of the church, of a sub-genius, which means I'm absolutely infallible, so don't dare contradict anything I say. As for my relationship with Ivan Stein, I deny all the rumors. <laughs> Remember, you're only infallible about your own nervous system. You know what's going on in your own nervous system, what, you, what realities you're creating out of the infinite flux of being. You don't know anything about anybody else's reality unless they tell you about it. You've got to listen very sympathetically to understand them. See, so it's a limited infallibility. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a reproduction of the Pope card from Discordianism. The bearer of this card is a genuine and authorized Pope. And I'd like to announce now that everybody participating is now obviously a Discordian Pope as well. You're all wildly infallible, at least about your own nervous system. And remember to excommunicate all your friends that you're meeting here today afterwards, because you're all Discordian Popes now, and that's the first thing you gotta do. The next thing we're gonna look at is a, a very important element to Discordianism, which is called Operation Mind Fuck. Oh boy, here we go. Yep, so that's it. We're gonna do Operation Mind Fuck here because um, this is a, a, an artistic and uh, publication-inclined version of pranksterism, um, which we're going to see a little bit of in this next shorter clip. And Project Mindfuck is kind of like Project, or Operation Mindfuck is very much like Fight Club's Project Mayhem, only it's less about like, um, you know, blowing up stuff and more about general pranksterism. Hey everyone, this is Elliot Edge of Odd Edges. How are you? I hope you enjoyed the uh, video you just saw. Surprise, surprise, this is just a sample. The full version is um, nearly two hours long, um, and there's a little Q&A session we did afterwards that makes it over two hours long. Uh, long story short is this. Um, if you enjoyed it, hey, I've got a Patreon page, and uh, that loud humming you're hearing right now as I record this, okay, that's the fan on my laptop. Everything I do is on my laptop, and that fan is currently operating. It's a MacBook. It's running without a battery, which is uh, because the battery has totally failed, and all my hardware has gone, like, critical failure mode in the last, like, 40, 50 days. So, you know, we've been putting a lot of uh, free content, free articles online. Just Google Elliot Edge or Odd Edges, and you'll see we've been making stuff for well over 10 years. Time to get the Patreon rolling. So if you like this video, if you want to see it out there sooner rather than later, full version, and you want to support us and get more videos out there, we got at least two more lectures that we'd like, uh, like to work on here. Uh, one is going to be on Sigmund Freud and Hannibal Lecter, and especially like Hannibal the TV show, how it relates to um, the Freudian tripartite self of the ego, superego, and id. And a, uh, another new long-form lecture on virtual reality and the paranormal, which is a lot of fun. So if you like what you see, jump on the Patreon. We will, of course, put you on a credits list at the end of the next video. Uh, and thanks for your support. And uh, we'll send you some behind the scenes footage of me, like, I don't know, brushing my teeth or something like that. Anyway, lots of love. I hope you enjoyed this stuff. And um, if you like what you see, please support it. All right. Have a beautiful day. Bye bye. Mwah. You talk dirty to me. You talk dirty to me.